Welcome back to Plenary Session. I'm joined here via Zoom by Dr. Jack West. Jack West uh, should be no stranger to many of you because we travel in similar circles, the podcasting circle, the oncology podcasting circle. It's a very small circle. Jack West is, of course, a faculty member at City of Hope. He's a thoracic oncologist, and he's always been a pioneer in digital health and telehealth. And he is well known for, I think, trenchant and critical commentaries uh, in oncology, while also remaining, I think, firmly within the fold of thoracic oncology. And so he navigates that very gracefully. Um, We're going to talk a little bit about his career, a little bit about digital media, and then finally about some lung cancer trials, which is my favorite thing. Jack, thanks so much for doing this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're also the digital editor at JAMA Oncology. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Since uh, the inception of the journal in around 2014, and it's been a nice trajectory seeing that grow over the last several years. Your first podcast was The West Wind. I loved it. (laughs) I love listening to that podcast. And uh, your new podcast with Charu Agarwal is uh, Beyond the Journal. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I, I have to say, I give you credit for uh, following a format, sticking with it over time and, 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 uh, finding a way to make it feasible, sustainable over time. Cause for us, it's been a labor of love. We mm-hmm. don't do it, you know, we don't make money. We self fund it and it's on hiatus right now, but you know, to, to be able to do something for some limited period of time is one thing, but to keep something going for years as you have is, is, is really something to keep it fresh and keep it going. You know, I think that's something that uh, it's also uh, you go, you're doing it definitely for the passion because I hate to break it to you. Plenary session is also not a lucrative enterprise. It's a loss. <laughs> it's a loss leader. <laughs> it's a loss leader. No advertisements, nothing. But I think you do it because you believe in it, but also it takes a certain amount of energy. But let me back up a little bit, Jack. I think listeners would love to know a little bit about your background. You know, you trained at so many great pra- places. It's been a while since I actually looked at your CV. I should have pulled it up. But if I recall, you went to Princeton as an undergraduate. And then you finished your training at uh, University of Washington, but I forget where you went to medical school and residency. Yeah, that was Harvard Medical School, and I stayed on to uh, go to Brigham and Women's Hospital for my internship and residency before moving to Seattle for uh, my fellowship and stayed on years after that uh, uh, working as a thoracic oncologist. Yeah. And you were both at University of Washington and then finally at Swedish before you made the move to City of Hope. That's right. I had done my training at, uh, at uh, the University of Washington Fred Hutch program in the, mm-hmm. the late 90s, uh, you know, kind of the, the height of or the flame out of uh, bone marrow transplants in solid tumors. So, mm-hmm. you know, that was an interesting perspective of, of one of my first experiences seeing something that was... Uh, a hot trend that that didn't pan out. So mm-hmm. not and not everything that we do uh, was destined to become a great standard of care. And you know maybe one of the first episodes of seeing a good reason to question uh, the trends that we were following. Yeah, it's a great example. Autologous stem cell transplant for solid tumor. You know, particularly breast cancer. I read ultimately that forty to fifty thousand women in the U.S. underwent it off protocol, outside of the randomized control trials, and then finally six randomized trials show basically no evidence of improved survival, massive toxicity, as you'd expect. Maybe a hint of actually PFS. You know, TTP was a little bit longer, but it didn't do what people thought it did. Right, and and again, uh, at, at least where I was doing it, it was in the context of clinical trials in in small cell and ovarian and breast and various things. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, one of the first examples of uh, we shouldn't be so in love with the concepts that we think we know the answers to these questions. And, you know, you've explored that in your books and podcasts and everything very well. But I think it's it is and should be a humbling reminder that we don't always know everything we think we know before we do the trials. That's really well put. Jack, who taught you thoracic oncology? Who were the people at Fred Hutch? Fred Hutch is not, you know, it's known for a lot of things, but it wasn't known, I don't think, for thoracic oncology. It was known for the heme malignancy side of things. How did you learn? That was, uh, that was Bob Livingston, who mm. was, was actually, at the time, very strong in uh, lung cancer. Uh, he had chaired the SWOG Lung Cancer Committee, but... I need to remember, this was a pretty humbling time in solid tumor and especially thoracic oncology. At the time that I entered it, uh, 
I had a lot of questions of why are you doing this as if I lost a bet or something to, to, to go into it. And when I was in my fellowship, one of the first journal clubs we had was around a JCO article. Essentially, I think it was a, just a commentary piece about is it worth treating metastatic lung cancer at the time? Because it was a legitimate question when the median survival benefit with chemo was seven week improvement. And this was often with cisplatin based chemo that, you know, you might have lived longer, but the treatment was arguably worse than the disease. And so it was, it was a pretty bleak time when you could go five years without opening JCO and still be current. And, you know, the treatment approach was essentially doublet, you know, pick your doublet. A lot of times it was carbo, paclitaxel for everybody for, and, and you just never be wrong. On the other hand, you didn't move the needle much. Our, our trials at that time were just looking for an improvement by six weeks and you know you could then debate whether that was clinically significant but that was the best we could do was basically carbopaclitaxel plus or minus drug x i remember the early 2000s and the paper that stood out for me was the joan schiller paper which everyone was you know <laughs> right this is the four the forearm randomized control trial and uh it was the basis by which people said you know you pick your doublet but um to me what stood out was that no doublet was better you know it was all right. the same yeah, that was very humbling because that was, you know, what we hoped would lead us out of the darkness. And mm -hmm. it was it was a very humbling, you know, you could say you have your regimen of choice. Uh, you know, there's there, there's no clear choice of regimen. So or you have your, your choice of regimen, no optimal regimen of choice. But we did improve on that. I mean, once we realized that histology mattered mm -hmm. and you could pick specific ones that was a small step and then of course i think the big quantum leaps came from identifying subgroups with molecular testing and and egfr then alc and others and immunotherapy and that's really what propelled us from a time when we anticipated improving survival by a few months to realistically hoping and expecting that a lot of our patients would live for years. Mm. That is, I definitely want to get into all those topics, but um, I promise listeners, I got to talk about some other issues before we get to the, the, the nitty gritty of lung cancer. The, sure. So we start, we have to start general interest and then we got to get where I want to take you to. Um, Go for it. The general interest I want to talk about is um, how, how were you always a leader in digital health? You know, um, uh, you and I, the West Wind and Plenary Session, I think those podcasts launched around the same time. And you were somebody who people always told me was always on the cutting edge of blogs, of, of podcasting, of Twitter. Um, what, where did your spark for digital health come from? Do you think it's related to your, you know, your passion for telehealth, which is, I think, related? Um, where did it come from? Where, where did that come from? Honestly, I just think I've always been a bit of a restless soul. Uh, I mean, that's when I mention also the your consistency with doing plenary session over time. I mean, the West Wind was about four different media platforms ago for me, and I'm not proud of that. I'm kind of a ooh new shiny object person, and some of them have stuck well over time. One of the things that I started doing now 15 years ago was uh, Grace, Global Resource for Advancing Cancer Education, with an idea. Honestly, at the time, it was pretty revolutionary because people weren't reaching out and doing content for patients. And the idea for it for me was if I can't get the information to the docs, because you could have great live meetings, but docs weren't going to them. And I was upset by this discordance between the best we knew based on the data and what was actually happening or not happening in practice. And I thought, well, I just want one person in the exam room to know the mm -hmm. best treatment. And if it, if the docs aren't going to do it, then, then I'm, I just want the patients to have access to that best information. But uh, that was just reading about trends. I remember uh, reading a book called The Long Tail by Chris Anderson, who was the editor of Wired Magazine in the 2005 or so, and talking about how when you make content digital, it's essentially free to distribute once you've created the content. And I love that idea because it eliminates the burdens of printing paper and mm. shipping stuff. And, you know, it's essentially uh, no resistance to distributing content, whether it's 
downloadable movies or these ideas. Mm -hmm. And that also worked well for some of the stuff that we were thinking about, which is uh, unusual cancer types. You know, I was really interested in what was called bronchial alveolar carcinoma, mm -hmm. which, you know, there's not tons and tons of those patients, but they're right. spread out around the world and you can create content and then have it be pullable by anybody who wants it forever once you've created that content. So that to me was an exciting idea. Plus now, uh, because of, uh, right. you know, we've, we've gotten used to doing so much virtual content through this and the pandemic has really highlighted how much we can do through Zoom and, and other settings. It, it opens up a world where it's very easy to talk to people from another you know, another time zone and even mm -hmm. another country. And you couldn't do that kind of thing. So I, I really like the, how nimble uh, the, the digital world makes us. You're preaching to the choir, but you know, you're, you're at least 15 years or 10 years ahead of me. And, uh, and I think I'm two years ahead of other people. I mean, I think people are finally coming along to, you know, when, when you were doing West Wind and I was starting Plenary Session, they were, you know, I think you and I were the only people doing it, not JC, you know, not the, the journals with their telephone right. interview podcast. Now I see three GU podcasts and I see, you know, and this is great. You know, you want a lot of channels, I think. Right. Well, I think it does raise all boats. It raises the credibility of it. And I think it just validates that this is a good idea. I think telemedicine, though, is something that, you know, I've been on the cusp of, but right. not in the world wasn't ready for it. I had started trying to get that going fully 10 years ago. I mean, we had a lot of the technology to do it, but the laws were not conducive to that. And the world wasn't ready. And even now, uh, where we've kind of test driven this. And I think it shows a lot of potential benefits. It also introduces its own disparities, but a lot of this could be fixed, but in the end, the utility of it or not is going to depend on whether the interstate licensure and right. reimbursement are compatible with that, because you know, let's be honest, we practice reimbursement based medicine. So um, that's, that's what's going to happen and whether it catches on as more than a, a niche offering. Yeah, I mean, state by state medical licensure is obviously one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. In my, I mean, it's really, it doesn't make any sense that that would be the case when everything about medical training is national from the examinations to the st to the standards, those are all national, yet we have state-by-state -state licensure, which has always allowed, you know, bad actors to slip through the cracks. That's one problem, and also prevented good actors from taking care of people at a distance. But I have one thing to say for you about telemedicine. Here's my worry, and we wrote an article about this, making this point. Um, I, I totally agree with you. There are many visits that... Um, are better off telemedicine. You don't need somebody to drive in three hours just to hear their scans continue to show no evidence of disease or that the tumors remain, you know, you remain in partial remission and things are good. You don't need them to come in for that. My worry is that one of the things it will unlock is um, it won't be used in lieu of our services. It'll be used in addition to. So I can imagine a wealthy person with multiple myeloma gets the opinion of Sloan Kettering, Arkansas, um, you know, uh, City of Hope, and um, Dana-Farber. Right now, they have a barrier, which is they have to fly to all these places, so maybe they're going to get two or three. But with true telemedicine, one could imagine they're getting the opinion of all of these doctors. When you have a disease like, it's different than lung cancer, I think, because there there's even less evidence in the front line as to which is the best um, treatment, you'll get total disagreement among experts. Um, and then I think the patient will be paralyzed. Okay, tell me what I'm Tell me how you feel about this, this sort of a decision, you know, too many opinions. Uh, I think that could absolutely happen. I think that's one of the potential problems. I haven't seen a lot of this, but I, I, I've even seen in lung cancer mm -hmm. that even with geographic barriers, there are people who yeah. I've seen who have gotten five opinions yeah. and I don't think there's any one that's better than another. So you don't add anything but confusion when that's right. there's plenty of room for judgment you know, I agree in, in myeloma for sure, but in lung cancer too, there's there's a lot of settings where we need to use judgment and we're left with less data than we'd like and, and getting more opinions doesn't make you any more wise. So yeah, that happens, but I think it's just a question of on balance, can it help more than it hurts? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the the live clinic model that we have is very far from perfect as it is. So mm -hmm. I just think it's a tool that 
can be used. It definitely isn't and shouldn't replace, you know, live visits for detailed discussions of both this the start of treatment and initiating a relationship or uh, tough discussions of end of life care, etc. But uh, as you say, for some settings, it's the very it's absolutely the right tool for the job. I mean, when you have people who are well survivorship visits, people doing well for their, you know, 18 month visit on osimertinib, et cetera, uh, that and I also think there can be a real value. And this is one of the things that we're doing with with Access Hope is, you know, trying to intercalate a subspecialist in the care team for people wherever they are mm -hmm. and you know we are at tertiary care centers but many people don't have that and i think that more and more of everything coming out is nuanced enough that it could be helpful to have a subspecialist who eats sleeps lives and breathes lung cancer or myeloma who can just help inform the discussions and work with the local docs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You hang the bag of chemo or Pembro mm -hmm. or whatever it is, it's the same, right. to, you know, the osimertinib's the same, but you don't need people to travel and, and get that at the tertiary care center 90 minutes away. But it's nice if once or twice a year when there's a decision-making point, they could integrate the opinion of someone who just focuses on that and it can be executed close to home. So I, I think it could open up that possibility as a complement to the model we have. But yeah, there's always there's always going to be abuses. It's not a perfect system. You know, it's always the case with technology. It's a tool can be used both ways. But I do think on balance, it is more positive than negative. And more than anything, it's inevitable. I mean, now that we have seen what this is capable of doing, why, you know, many people will say, let's just do it on Zoom. Um, you know, one thing I think is interesting about you is that these seem to be pretty different. You know, you, you, you were a pioneer in, in podcasting, blogging, reaching out to patients directly. You're a pioneer in telehealth because I remember you were saying it before anyone ever said it. I mean, you were way ahead of the curve there. And you also are willing to some, you know, not willing to, you sometimes look at a clinical trial that your colleagues all say, you know, they all say one thing and you say, you know, I, I disagree. And what I think is that, that the threat, the threat is, you know, you're a little bit flexible in your thinking. You're not wedded to any paradigm. You're not doing what you're told. Many of us don't go into digital because in oncology, our bosses never told us that was a world we're allowed to go in. You know, it's all published paper and that's the world we know. You were never constrained by the world you knew. Do you feel that's accurate? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I've i really felt that I've been a restless soul. When I was at Swedish Cancer Institute, I was seeing patients a lot, but, you know, I just carved out time to do other things. And I felt that that other work that I was doing kept me on focus about everything that was new, kept me relevant in the field, which is not easy to do over many, many years if you mm -hmm. move into a setting that uh, more directly compensates you for private practice, you know, turnstile care mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. than uh, than uh, than trial. research oriented right, yeah. and publishing. So, mm -hmm. I mean, even if that is an interest, it's you get pretty adept at what is the coin of the realm wherever you are, and 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 so um, you know, I I think I was just always eager to not lose that relevance and uh, and was curious about what it could do. So I also think that having uh, Dr. Bob Livingston, when 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 he trained me, he was essentially moving from uh, lung cancer to breast cancer. He actually went to chairing the breast cancer committee for SWOG from lung cancer. Mm -hmm. So he was kind of ready to hand over the reins. And, and I, I kind of precociously took on a lot of that myself. And I think that helped me because I wasn't indoctrinated in this is the way we do things. I, I was more kind of raising myself. And, and that led me to look at things with more of an open mind more critically. And I, I don't know, I've just not been uh, afraid to be wrong. I, I don't know that that's necessarily the way to view it. I think that the best way to view all of this that we debate, you know, you've 
seen some of my heated discussions with people yeah. like Nate Pinnell mm -hmm. on I Twitter. It's yep. it's not it's not personal. It's no. about the data. No. And that I think is great. And and I've always had a mind of, you know, show me the data if uh, we're going back years, but in 2017 we had the uh, Keynote O2 1G trial, which was a phase two that was essentially a randomized trial like Keynote 189. Okay. Yeah. And it looked good and it actually led to an FDA approval that I thought was premature. I uh, said, this PFS is. PFS only, no OS at the time. I, as I uh, recall. But like it, it was yeah. impressive, but, right. but I thought. We have phase three data coming. Right. We don't need to right. move Rushing ahead before that. Right. And uh, and and there was reason to debate this. And uh, but when Keynote one eighty nine came out, I yeah. said, okay, it's over. That's yeah. what I wanted to see. And there were times, you know, before we actually saw the data on Pacific. One of the early things I did in Westwind was, you know, based on the press release of PFS saying, I'm not convinced this is not enough for me right. yet. And mm -hmm. then you see the, the curves and you see the time to development of metastatic disease or death with a hazard ratio of 0.52 and say, okay, now that's good enough for me. To me, I think that that's valuable. That's not flip-flopping. That is using new data to inform your opinions rather than just using confirmation bias to stand steadfastly by something you thought a year ago. So I am, I think it's a good thing to uh, kind of continue to reevaluate critically the the information as it comes in and question that and, and not take it personally and not to make it a personal attack. That's what I hope to not do. I just don't want to jump on a bandwagon if I think it's too early. Yeah, and I think that's something that people routinely miss with maybe you, me, and many other people is that none of us have ever said under no circumstances and there's no evidence that will ever persuade me. We always say, <laughs> we need a little bit more evidence and we'll get on board. And then when that more evidence comes and we do get on board, it's not a flip-flop, it's what you had said at the outset. So no one, you, you, know, you never said I'll never be persuaded under any circumstances. It's plus always, I, yeah. Plus I also think that it counts more coming from someone who nothing is more valuable than someone who changed their opinion along the way, was not right. always a cheerleader, but right. said, look, I, if you doubt now, I thought like you, and here's why I don't anymore. Right. That's to me more powerful than somebody who has always been cheerleading even before the, the data were there for it. So I, I think it's especially valuable to, to have a range of opinions and change as the data emerge. That's the right word for it. Let's talk about some specific lung cancer data, and then we'll come back to these culture issues. Okay, here's one thing. I mean, I'm, I'm with you. Keynote 189 is a very persuasive study. And of course, um, the FDA, I see, is weighing in on this issue. And the issue that I want to talk about is that for a patient uh, with a newly diagnosed um, uh, uh, adenocarcinoma and a pd one of, let's say, 51%, you know, are they better off with chemo, pembro, or pembro alone? That's the question. And... Um, I guess as a little bit of background, I mean, one thing people should note that, of course, you know, nivolumab and pembrolizumab quickly established themselves in the second line setting um, in non-small cell lung cancer. And I think we were all persuaded because they went up against chemotherapy that was a standard of care and had overall survival benefit. And then, as always the case with all these products in every setting, the question is, how do you move it up front? So I guess my question to you is, um, and then the FDA recently weighed in on this. They have their, I think you saw it at ASCO this year, they have done sure. this pooled analysis. And to me, there's a little bit of a tension here because they always remind us that, you know, we just approve or not approve products. We don't dictate the practice of medicine. But now you're getting into it, aren't you, FDA? Because you're coming to, you're pooling trials that are sort of disparate and comparing a, a, a control arm against different arms that weren't really tested head to head. So my question for you, healthy 55-year-old man, um, no driver mutations, pdl one 55%. Are you going to give him chemo pembro or pembro alone? I think it's going to depend on their level of symptoms and their tumor burden. Okay. In the in the end, I really think one of the factors that uh, could use some more granularity is that it's not as if PDL one is a binary, Correct. or you know, it, it, and and more than fifty percent is uh, depends. And you said fifty one or fifty five percent. If it's 90%, I think that's different than 50, 55%. Uh, 
and and you can I think that either one's defensible but if I have someone who has a significant tumor burden if I'm anything less than really convinced that if this patient progresses in the next two months that their performance status may decline and they may not be a strong candidate for chemo doublet because there can be attrition for all sorts of reasons uh, that I'm going to err on the side of chemoimmuno. On the other hand, if they've just got pleural studying and they're minimally or asymptomatic, and particularly if they have very high PDL1, I don't want to overtreat these patients. I mean, we should bear in mind that although I think a lot of the Keynote 189 trial, it does include uh, maintenance uh, PEM, pemetrexid, pembrolizumab. And it's very likely for a lot of these patients, one drug is doing the heavy lifting right. and one is along, along for the for ride mm -hmm. for a very long time. It's costly. It's got potential toxicity. So I'm all for people being on these drugs when they need them, but not if they're gratuitous. And so I think one advantage, if you can do monotherapy, is you at least know that what you're doing is, you know, what you're achieving is ascribed to that drug. And you're not just giving gratuitous pemetrexid when the pembrolizumab is doing the job. Uh, so I understand, and I think that would argue for us to be judicious, but there, that pooled analysis and, you know, there's various other posters at this year's ASCO that all converged as relatively soft evidence that, when in doubt, you casting a wider net may be a good approach. And so if I had someone with a significant tumor burden, symptomatic losing weight during their workup, that's where I would I would be very comfortable. And I would not say that either choice is wrong. Uh, I don't like to be wishy-washy. I just think I wouldn't want to overcall this as having a clearly right best answer. Yeah, no, that's well put. And I totally agree with you. I think 90% uh, to 100% is different than 50 to 89%. And I think that because there are lots of studies that suggest, I think, substantively different response rates, like the Aguilar paper, I think, Annals of Oncology, maybe 2017. Yeah, that, that's, that's right. Yeah, or, yeah that's, um, that's about right. And uh, by the way, there was also uh, Mark Awad and colleagues. Uh, there's yeah. a paper that just came out this week and uh, in TMB, jam, in general, yeah, on TMB, yeah. mm -hmm. and that's not most patients, but uh, a small minority of patients with high TMB of 19 just do screamingly well. So these are the kind of of factors that that could weigh in, I think, to inform a decision. And I think it's appropriate. Some patients are going to be resistant to chemo, and I'd factor that in as well. Some patients may just want to do anything they can to get control of it up front. I think that's well put. What I think is very interesting, though, is that um, the US FDA, they have individual patient level data on all these trial patients. And so presumably, they know not just that somebody was over 50% and enrolled in one trial or the other, they actually know the specific cutoff of 60, 70, 80, 90, etc. When they did their pooled analysis, they don't break it out at different cutoffs, they only break it out in the way in which the original labels go to. And to me, that speaks to uh, something interesting there. Why are they not carving up the data? As you say, it's a continuous variable. The, the company's incentive is always to take the largest population that will have the smallest statistics going to be benefit. But somewhere in that, you know, there's, and then we do these kind of nested subgroup analyses as we see with um, atezolizumab in the adjuvant setting. Above 20 and then above one, which includes above 20. Why not just one to 90, 19? Um, it's a game. And I guess my question is the FDA, they, they are choosing to in, involve themselves in this debate by doing that pooled analysis. They didn't have to do it, it's an un, but, but, by the, but they chose to do it. They brought themselves into the practice of medicine, I think, um, by involving themselves in that. But they don't break it out at different cut points. Why not? Yeah, I, I can't answer that process. I think that um, I, I spend a little less time than you do. Uh, feeling angst about what the FDA is or isn't doing, but I do feel that it's a it's a challenging, you know, it's it's a frustrating place to be. I mean, having uh, you know clinical trials over and over again that look at outdated, you know, 2017 mm -hmm. uh, uh, control arms, and and uh, at why do we need a sixth? Uh, you know, ALK inhibitor compared yeah. against crizotinib anymore. Right. I mean, that adds nothing to patient care. And I think that the one thing that could really help is having, uh, uh, whether it's a, 
uh, an immune checkpoint inhibitor, ALK inhibitor, EGFR inhibitor that actually comes in at 60 or 70 percent the cost and oh. and equal efficacy. Yeah. But, you know, their FDA is not like, allowed to look at you know, yeah. we're we're not going to consider this. We're categorically uh, ab- absolved. And uh, I think that's a challenge because I think it, it does play into exactly what what I would do if I were in you know, working in close partnership with uh, with pharma uh, to to protect the the system, but uh, it's you know it's it's frustrating because uh, I I was taught you know 15, 20 years ago mm-hmm. about the shifting curve of science clinical trials that were done at taxpayer support and you know the the cooperative groups versus what is pharma supported research and that's only extended over time so that it's it's very rare to get questions asked that aren't uh incentivized by by pharma and uh, so i think that's that's one of the biggest problems you you get what you incentivize and we yeah. have a system that uh, the engine behind everything is pharma support i think that's that's well put let me talk to you about checkmate 816 yeah, yeah. pat patrick ford study um very provocative study, you know, resectable lung cancer, mostly twos and threes, um, undergoing nivolumab chemotherapy or chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting, and uh, the primary endpoints of what path CR is better. Um, I didn't really, I didn't really talk too often about path CR and lung before this study. <laughs> I wasn't a path CR kind of guy in lung. I thought they were talking about breast, but okay, fine. Um, EFS is better. Uh, OS is trending, immature. The question I always have with OS and such a study will be the control arm patients, some of them will eventually relapse. And when they relapse, do they actually get Pembro chemo? Do they get Pembro? Or are they never going to get a checkpoint inhibitor in their whole cancer journey? You know, I think that's a question for OS at least. My question to you is, I mean, what do you think about these data? Well, I think it's it's not that different from the agony we've had over uh, Adora, and mm-hmm. in that, yeah. and by this I just mean, yes, I, I was someone screaming from the rooftops yeah. in a curative setting. I want a COS. The challenge is that <clears throat> it does take a long time to get that, and in the meantime, what do you do with the information you have? And I, I think there were many frustrating flaws to Adora, but I, I think with a huge difference in DFS that. Uh, it's appropriate to give the patient the benefit of the doubt until you know more. And I kind of feel the same way about, uh, about EFS here. I mean, one issue is that uh, we, if you're going to be doing chemo, if you're going to be considering uh, immunotherapy, having a program that consolidates that into three cycles preoperatively rather than extending to 15, 16 months of post-operative treatment, I think is a good trade. And uh, yes, we don't know everything we'd like to know about, you know, whether EFS is going to translate to a, uh, a survival benefit, but we have seen in, in uh, Pacific that you know, the survival benefits hold out at five years, which is mm-hmm. four years after people have completed DERVA. Mm-hmm. To me, that's a, a little less frustrating than, you know, Adora. The, the challenge is, is, is how much of an achievement is it to have the scans look better while you're on this suppressing but not nece- necessarily eradicating therapy? I'm more hopeful that a short course of immunotherapy as well as the chemo could translate to sustained benefits. So it's not perfect, but I think uh, if you're just incurring three cycles of of uh, adding the nivolumab to the chemo, right. you'd already be giving perioperatively. And the other advantage that uh, I think was really useful is that getting preoperative therapy in is a lot easier than getting post-operative therapy. Sure, I, that's I mean, always I, I, true. Every, yeah, pretty much every solid tumor. <laughs> in, in every setting. And, and yeah. we haven't really looked that hard at that in lung cancer. But when you look at the real-world data, it's, 
it's embarrassing how badly we do at delivering post-operative standard of care chemo. It's mm -hmm. about 50% topping out at 50%. And uh, that's, that's awful. And so if you can actually achieve it rather than have it just be a thought process, a, a thought experiment, I'm, I'm for that too. So I, I think that unless or until we know more that that counts for something and and i'd say you know you are much more of a, of a careful assessor of of many of the entire oncology landscape and and that includes heme i mean god i i've only learned that as needed every 10 years for <laughs> abim recertification but but the more we learn from the breast cancer community that mm -hmm. adopted this a long time ago, the more encouraging I think it is that this could be borne out to be more than just a short term uh, uh, endpoint. It's kind of you say, I, I have an advantage, which is I attend three months a year on services, Hemonk, broad consult at the general and VA and always with a fellow. So I have to cover it all. So it keeps <laughs> me a little fresh. Um, but on this issue, okay, I have a, a few thoughts for you. Go for Look, it. In, in, in lung cancer, I was always very pers I was always persuaded that cytotoxic chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting, if you increase the disease-free survival, I know that that will someday mean increased cure rates, improved OS. I think that correlation was very robust. But I also had a doubt, like I think you do and many others do, that targeted therapy has the same sort of property that DFS invariably predicts OS because we had seen in examples where that was a little bit off you know, that, you know, that there's a DFS benefit, but no OS with a targeted drug. Because in my mind, a targeted drug doesn't eradicate microscopic disease. It often just suppresses it a little bit, um, the growth kinetics. Uh, similarly, with immunotherapy, I have a different sort of perplexity, which is that I think that there's a fraction of people, even with advanced disease, who have long-term durable remissions for which that I'm not sure that they're actually benefiting it all that much more from getting it early and upfront. So then back to these issues, I mean, Adora, one of the challenges with Adora is, I mean, you know, I guess one is like the, the amount of money you have to spend to avert an event and the fact that some people are going to be taking this pill for years on end who are already cured. I mean, I think that's a challenge and different dollar amounts are tossed out. I calculated it something like in the $2 million ballpark. I know other people have done quote unquote cost effectiveness analysis and they have more favorable conclusions. But the challenge I always have with that is when you do that work, you have to impute how many quality adjusted life years are being added. And that is somewhat of a guessing game because the trial has not yet measured that, you know, so that's my challenge there. But I think Adora, Checkmate 816, and even the um, uh, 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 atezolizumab. Um, Pearls, from, the per, Keynote yeah. 091, yeah. The, no, the, no, no. I'm oh, sorry, uh, the uh, Empower, Empower 010, uh, oh, oh, right. Is it 010? Yes, Empower 010, yes. O1, oh, yes. Right. Okay, um, Heather Wakeley's paper in New England. That's Journal. right. Yes, okay. So Empower 010, Checkmate 816, and Adora, they're all testing sort of the routine upfront administration to a lot of people of agents that we are always already giving to the people with relapse disease. And I'm pretty confident that every one of these studies, when we finally get the data from the ultimate OS, whenever it comes, five years or 10 years, they are not crossing over people. They're running it in places where they just never, it's either nivolumab up front or you never get it. Or in Adora, you know, we already had flora, uh, flora. Uh, we already had it. We already knew that Aussie is the preferred, arguably frontline drug. Um, I bet some people in the Adora control arms are gonna be getting gefitinib when they progress. Um, that will influence OS, you know? And uh, in my mind, it will sort of leave open that question. Thoughts on this, Jack? I think you're absolutely right. I think that the 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 real issue about about uh, Adora is whether over treating lots of people, uh, treating everyone up front, is better than treating as needed if everyone has unfettered access to osimertinib if and when they need it. And uh, yeah, I think that's an issue. I would hope that whether it's with osimertinib or almolertinib, if that becomes available in China and other places as a less expensive third gen agent, you know, I, 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 it becomes at some point borderline unconscionable for people to not have access to checkpoint inhibitors and the best EGFR inhibitors, mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as years go on, uh, that's a terrible, uh, embarrassment and, uh, but but yes, I think that's an issue. I, I just, 
think it's it's hard to it's it's hard to envision there being many places of industrialized you know third uh, first world medicine where mm -hmm. where you don't have access to a checkpoint inhibitor early on mm -hmm. with metastatic disease if you don't have a driver mutation i should hope not but i but i bet there are a lot of places that don't get oc at frontline uh EG yes, I, yeah? okay. I think right now but yeah. i i would love i really hope that if 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 the development of albalertinib has any benefit whether right. it's th that it's approved at 60 percent the cost right. and, or that it changes the pricing of OC and, yeah. and, and shines a light on, you know, I think that's been one of the really good things that uh, uh, Bishal Gawali and, and uh, Charu Agarwal did a very nice yeah, uh, publication. Yeah. And, and it really said, what's the good of having a great drug if it's priced extortionately and not right. available to people? Right. And I think there needs to be more attention to that issue. Right. No, I mean, I, yeah, I totally agree. Um, you know, in my mind, this is the key question, which is like, and I think it even applies to Pacific because I have never yet seen, and maybe I just missed it, in the control arm on Pacific when you progress, what percent of people ultimately got a PD-1 inhibitor, a PD-01 inhibitor uh, in terms of the OS in Pacific? I have not yet seen that. Um, maybe I missed it. Do they nope. have the public? I don't think I've ever seen that. No. Yeah. I mean, I would want it to be 100% or near 100%. Um, uh, because that's the real question. Do the, is the routine upfront application benefiting people? But on this issue, I think many of these trials are run globally and they don't have access to the drug. But I think what that really leads is a situation where it's tough to in, use that drug in the U.S. Because, or tough to use that data in the U.S. because it's not quite what we're doing. And it's also bad for that country because the moment that trial is over, they're not going to get that new drug either. <laughs> but here's my next, the next thing I want to pick with you. CT, MRI, PET. I've been looking a lot at these lung cancer studies, and I notice sometimes that, you know, obviously in the United States, the standard of care uh, for staging is, you know, I like to get PETs and I like to get MR brains. And I think the NCCN is, you know, people are on board with MR brain staging. Um, you can, we can debate whether or not a CT brain is adequate for CNS staging, but there's two things I notice about some of these trials. They... Um, you know, either use sort of inadequate staging on the front end, which means that you might have some people who are really at higher stage trickle into your study, or they they do surveillance brain MR, or surveillance CT, which has never been my practice for somebody who, you know, I screened them on, you know, when they had de novo metastatic disease, they're doing fine, they have no CNS complaints. I'm not doing a brain MR every two months or three months. And if I give you a drug that has, you know, CNS penetration versus a drug that has no CNS penetration, and I also build in all these scans that are not the standard of care, I may artificially see, you know, time to cranial relapse is much better and PFS is much better, but that's not really representative of the real world practice. So what are your thoughts on staging and surveillance? You know, it, there's two errors. There's not doing enough and then there's doing too much. And Well, I, I agree completely, uh, particularly, I, I haven't thought that much about the last, the second mm -hmm. point, mm -hmm. but I think, everything you said is perfectly correct that we don't uh do surveillance uh cns imaging in patients who are a year or two post-op and don't have neurologic symptoms so it's one thing if someone has a seizure or vision changes and and falls but uh otherwise you wouldn't do that and and I don't know how high the rate of subclinical brain right. metastases right. would be. It wouldn't probably be too long before that manifests itself. There's not a lot of real estate there. Uh, but yeah, that's an issue. But I've long been frustrated by the issue of uh, if you're going to make a big deal out of and you know that your agent has a big advantage for CNS activity, which is legitimate, uh, and you're you're giving a drug that costs $18,000 a month, spend the money to do the right staging studies. Right. And, and I, I think that includes both, both a PET and a brain MRI yeah. uh, because, uh, and, and to say, well, that's not our standard where we are. Well, tough, neither is Osamertin. <laughs> right, uh, exactly. So, yeah. so do, do the work and, and don't load the dice in your favor because that's what I, I think this really does. So we, we've seen, uh, you know, in the, the so-called uh, Wu and colleagues adjuvant trial that was mm -hmm. with Jafitnib versus mm -hmm. cisvinorelbine. I mean, those patients did very poorly, uh, you know, basically as soon as they finished Jafitnib and mm -hmm. both arms 
went straight down in PFS to almost no survivors without progression at, by three or four years. That suggests that these are just understaged patients to mm -hmm. begin with. And, and I think if you have a staging system that doesn't include mediastinal staging or PET scans or brain MRIs, it's a don't ask, don't tell kind of right. you know, situation. And right. so uh, in a startling turn of events, osimertinib is better than placebo for patients with metastatic, uh, you know, right. with, with occult metastatic right. disease. So I don't think this tells us anything we wouldn't have assumed. And it doesn't tell you that you're curing patients and it doesn't, it's not even necessarily patients with, with, um, you know, with resected, re with resectable disease. Now, they they have I was pretty vocal about this and there have been some subsequent analyses that indicated there are not obvious differences in those who got or did not get a brain MRI. So I'm not confident. I don't think that's necessarily going to explain away the differences we've seen. But I still think methodologically, that's a real issue for that matter. I mean, if you think your drug's good, you don't need it for three years. I right. think that that's really right. a big right. issue. That's really, uh, that's not, to, in my mind, what we historically thought of as adjuvant. Now, right. the breast community could differ where you're on decades-long therapy, but I think that that's, a, that's just a different concept than the paradigm that I was taught of adjuvant therapy of, of uh, uh, of ostensibly mopping up, eradicating right. microscopic residual disease. microscopic right. disease for cure. And right. Right. if you're not cured by two and a half years of therapy, then you're not cured. Right. Uh, you know, then the uh, next six months isn't going to be the difference. Right. I mean, um, you know, in ovarian, we of course had that great study many years ago of CA125. If you right. if you if you check it, you'll find it, and you find it, you treat, and you treat, and then you don't live any longer. You just get more chemo. Um, and and what that's always an open question here. Your point about staging is good. I mean, the the, the thing I would say about sort of of course when somebody points out that that this is an issue to the industry, they'll do some sort of post hoc analysis to try to say that it didn't matter. But it's very difficult actually to really know if those analyses really get to the root of it. Um, and I'm glad, you know, and of course, if you have 18,000 a month to spend on the experimental drug, you certainly got 650 bucks to get a pet once, you know, or 320 bucks <laughs> to get an MR, um, as you could do. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about driver mutations. Now, you tell me if I'm wrong, okay? Um, these, are, these are the driver mutations I think we have. I think we have the original EGFR, L858R, and Exxon 19. You know, we got EGFR drugs. We've got ALK. We've got ROS1. We've got now RET. Uh, we've also got Trek fusions, although if you, when you see one, Jack, give me a call. <laughs> you got Trek fusions, okay? Um, we've got CMET. Um, yep. We've got KRAS, G12C. Um, and we've got Exxon 20. Um, and we got BRAF. Uh, am I missing anything? Well, NRG1 could potentially NRG1. be considered. That, that would also be in a, a rare. And then there's the, uh, you know, with an asterisk is HER2, where okay. we have therapies that, you know, do have at least strong phase two data to support them. Um, so, yeah, it's a growing collection. It's a growing collection. thing. Yep. Of this collection, is it fair to say that... Um, in a few settings, the drugs are still reserved for second line. Isn't that the case? So KRAS, G12C, it's a second line drug. Yeah. It's not a front line. Um, Exxon 20, it's only second line. It's not front line. Correct. RET, RET, still second line, not front line. Well, yeah, the RET and MET, I mean, the data are and quite strong. And, um, you know, I think that's debatable. I, I don't mm -hmm. know that they specify, actually, but it's been better tested there. It's just that... You know, when you have drugs like uh, the Exxon 20 agents, KRAS. They're uh, mediocre. They're, yeah, they're not in the same range as osimertinib, yeah. electinib, right. or lorlatinib. And and some of these, KRAS, we, we did just see the the, yeah, the, the pooled analysis oh, okay. uh, from, from, uh, from the uh, FDA and, and some other data in the past that show that the patients with KRAS mutations seem to benefit from chemoimmunotherapy about as much as everyone else. And so when you have perfectly good non-targeted standards of care that achieve 50% response rates and you're 
your targeted therapy is a little less than that. I think it, it doesn't scream a mandate to, to give them up front the way that osimertinib does, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's, and, and, um, I would say the same thing, you know, Exxon 20 is yeah. debatable. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not that effective or non-toxic. And, uh, so I think it's, it's, and it's been tested overwhelmingly in previously treated patients. So right. that's where the approval is. Um, one point I want to make about Exxon 20, I don't know if you know this, but you know, we got the two ones, what mobile serotonib and the, uh, Ab Am Amavantamab. Yep. Amavantamab, Amavantamab and mobile serotonib. The NCCN guidelines actually say if you progress on one, you can get the other. You know where they found that data? <laughs> where do they get that? You progress on one, you can get the other. It says it says. Well, I, I mean, let's let's be honest. I mean, uh, you know, NCCN is not tablets that came down from God. I yeah. mean, this is just it's a group of people with biases and opinions mm -hmm. who collect. You know, you you aggregate biases and opinions. It doesn't make it the the absolute irrefutable always evidence-based answer i mean it's 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 the best you can do under the circumstances i think that we shouldn't we shouldn't uh you know be too irreverent of that as 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 more than it is but it compels and medicare to pay it compels insurers to pay and that's what they've got well and and i think that's what it's that's a lot of what the 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 purpose is is to yeah. to to underscore to to provide pressure to do that yeah yeah and um well here's the other point i want to make about the driver mutations you know um for years and by the way through a, a long quirk of fate when in my old job in oregon i inherited uh uh some faculty member moved on you know you may know khalid tolba moved on and so i actually inherited like a third of his patients for a while so i took over and so i had a you know a fair bit of um um Exxon 20 back then actually, you know, was really not so easy uh, because there was no drugs. You know, Exxon 20 was tough. Um, and yeah. uh, and Elk, et cetera, and, all, and all, his, all his patients I inherited. And, um, um, you know, and, and, and then over the years I heard people say like, um, you know, somebody had a new diagnosis of lung cancer and they said, oh, it's EGFR. That's good. You know, good. Yeah, good. And I said, it's, you know, it's, it's I mean, they're drugs. Yes. And the drugs are good. You know, I, I don't get me wrong, but you know, it's, it's, it's still a tough diagnosis. This is a 40 year old woman, you know, this is a 50 year old, you know, guy. And so David Benjamin, who's a fellow at UCI, we did a little project we published, um, I think in the journal cancer, where we looked at the average age in which you're afflicted with one of these cancers. And, you know, it's actually 71 years old. If you're get the sort of classic smoking related, your PDL one is 52% cancer, you know, that's 70, that's 71. But if you get to sort of ALK and Ross one and EGFR, you know, they're much younger than that. They're often a decade or 15 years, even younger than the average age. And so even if you take the best case, you know, you, we're just going to pool the OS from every trial sequentially, you know, and just say, we're going to give you, you know, seven years survival with ALK, you know, whatever. Even if you do that, um, the drugs, although great, active, they don't even put a dent in the extra years of life, you know, the person who gets lung cancer at 71, they're losing maybe 12 years of life lost or 15, you know, not good. But the person who's getting it at 40, they're just losing so many years of life, even you have all the drugs. And I feel like that part of the story isn't told as often when you've got that 40 year old in your clinic who's dying because they're progressing and, you know, there's just nothing we have. Thoughts? I think that's absolutely true i mean it, i think though we we have to take our successes as we get them and mm -hmm. and we just can't be complacent about it i mean when we have uh you know on twitter or in the lung cancer community leaders in the patient space and 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 now 15 years after the the nonprofit grace that i'd started you know there's a much much stronger patient community patient advocates and you know, the Ross wonders and ALK mm -hmm. positives and, mm -hmm. and EGFR resistors, et cetera. Um, you know, these are often people who are living with their disease for years and years, but when they ultimately succumb, it's still a tragedy beyond words. And yeah. as you say, these are, these are people who may have lived for five, seven, eight years, but it's cold comfort when they still die at 57. So I guess, you know, you've always been, um, 
you've always been very courageous to push on these topics and often, you know, a bit lonely. Of course, you know, you've been joined in recent years by a few of us, but, um, uh, you know, I mean, I'm very different than you because, um, you know, one, I guess I'm actually, you know, I don't know if you know this, I'm in, I'm in epidemiology and biostatistics now. I'm, I'm you know, so, so I got one foot out and, you know, I, half of my research is on general medicine issues. And I think other people are also a little bit different than you um, uh, because they either do multiple tumor types or they do health policy broadly. Um, you're somebody who's, I think, got it, I got a hard, a hard, Road to hoe, uh, um, because you're in, you're a thoracic oncologist, and the people you spend time with at the meetings are thoracic oncologists, and and you're also critical of thoracic oncology studies. I've got a couple questions. Um, you're a smart guy, and um, uh, but there are a lot of smart people in your field. Surely they see some of the same things you see, you know, but they're not vocal about it. Um, why is that the case? Why is it, you, you use the word cheerleader. I would say I put, you know, even, even the smart people, they're 90% of people in oncology. It's a lot of cheerleading. And when I looked at the oncology tweets this, this year, um, it's, my goodness, it's, it's the thickest coat of butter I've ever seen. I mean, you, you can, yeah, I mean, people, people always like, you know, they're like, oh, you criticize a trial, you know, your tone. I was like, they like to hear, great job, everyone's great. We're always doing great. We're the best. Um, it's hard to deviate from that. Why are we so um, addicted to this, this cheerleading? Yeah, I, I think about that. I also, because I, I look even broadly when you're not just talking about clinical trials, but you know, just how we interface with other people on Twitter. I mean, I don't want to just throw rocks, but at the same time, I don't think it's that informative or insightful or discriminating to if you always are, you know, sunshine all the time, then mm -hmm. I think that that just shows you're not not critic you're not thinking critically. And so I don't want to be that person. I um I I I do think it's unfortunate that that at least in Twitter oncology there's a lot of people who are uh, you know, like a Walmart greeter and just a big smile <laughs> for everyone. And mm -hmm. if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything. And it's all, I, I think that it's easier to glad hand, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. easier to, uh, people give a lot of likes for for positive thinking. And, uh, and it works for a lot of people. It's just, I couldn't do it if I wanted to, because that's just not the authentic me. Mm -hmm. But I, again, I don't want to take pot shots. I think that that the critical the the likes of the 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 challenging questions that i bring up uh do help i think that they get some traction on twitter and and it's a lot better to have a few people even if it's not the majority saying these things i mean one of the the questions that came up was there was a presentation of uh, the lung map 1800A mm -hmm. trial. It was continue with pembrolizumab with ramucirumab versus standard of care, usually docetaxel ramucirumab. That was a mm -hmm. randomized phase oh, two. It showed that. an overall survival benefit. And the uh, discussant uh, had said, gee, I think this could standard could arguably should stay in standard of care. And I said, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. um, but... But that's something where it, it was not as clearly of a bandwagon for that. I think that there were some proponents of that and there were many who were critical of it. And and uh, I didn't feel like I was just alone screaming into the void there. And nor do I totally feel that that was the case with Adora, where I think that was much more of a, a din of heaping praise Um but that was abetted by, you know, the media likes a positive story, mm -hmm. the professional societies scream it from the rooftops, it's good for business. You know, I think there's lots of incentives for 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 positive results. And and certainly the, the companies will give a platform for it. So there's plenty of incentives for for being uh for being positive most of the time. But uh, I'm I do think that adding this platform for people to like and share. And I know it's getting some traction and it's it's made these now 
two-sided discussions where we'll have a debate about it. For we had them a long, long time after Adora, where there was at least some pro and con discussion, mm-hmm. and it wasn't just a you know an ongoing uh, you know rapture about it. You know, that's really well put. I got some thoughts for you on this. But first, I want to just say a few things about the phase two, which I think is so interesting, the randomized phase two. Now, of course, um, in the regulatory science, accelerated approval was always used for endpoints thought reasonably likely to predict benefit. Um, so the endpoint was kind of, you know, it's not a measure of living longer, living better, but it's possible it will someday predict that. But we measured the endpoint with statistical precision. Like we really knew that was the response rate. We really knew that was the PFS. When Scott Gottlieb became FDA commissioner, he said, why shouldn't FDA approval, and he was joined by Friends of Cancer Research, to say, why shouldn't FDA approval take overall survival that's statistically unpersuasive and let that be a basis of accelerated approval? And the drug that hit that was Lartruvo or Olaritumab, the uh, soft tissue sarcoma drug. And it had a phase two trial with a 14-month OS benefit in a disease that hadn't seen anything. And had, OS was not the primary endpoint and a huge benefit Um, And it led to accelerated approval. The company made $600 million. And then the phase three comes back with like super imposable curves. And we saw that. And I think you mentioned, um, uh, what was it? Uh, Selumetinib and docetaxel. Uh, That was a great example. We've seen that in lung. Um, uh, uh, We've seen that over and over again. It's actually a phenomenon that when an underpowered phase two trial has a benefit on a non-primary endpoint, it's almost always exaggerated and can even be spurious entirely. And I think what people didn't really realize was if we really start to say that underpowered phase twos that get a lucky break can change practice, you've actually changed the incentive structure in the marketplace quite a bit. Because in the old days, there's something about it, you know, drug companies, they can't fake activity. I mean, either drug's active or it's not active. You can't fake that. But you can actually run so many underpowered phase two trials that by chance alone, some are going to be successful. And I worry that we're getting to that place because I see over and over again in every field from oh, oligometastatic treatment of radiotherapy in lung. These are underpowered phase two trials. OS is not the primary endpoint. They're saying, oh, should change our practice. I want to wait for the phase three. Um, for this trial example that you see for, I think, bevacizumab or a lot, and isn't that an under, underpowered phase two? Um, all of these are examples where people are putting a lot of credit on a study that is really, really unreliable, and they're creating an incentive to do more of these unreliable studies. Well, I think what's particularly sad is that, you know, I feel like we're uh, we're Charlie Brown and Lucy's holding the football and we keep, you know, missing it and landing on our butts and we don't learn from that experience over and over again. I mean, the the if we're walking down the road of of clinical trials, like there's so many bodies along the side of the road of failed mm-hmm. phase twos that we thought, wow, this is amazing. Can't wait to see the, the, do we even need a validating phase three? And then, you know, there's there's all these drugs that we are are relegated to the scrap heap. We talked about selimatinib, there was ASA 404, there's onartuzumab. I mean, many trials that were like, wildly positive phase twos and right. and now we, we look at uh tiragolumab and and the the cityscape trial looked extremely impressive and people are breathlessly hyping that and now there's many 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 trials of not just tiragolumab but lots of other anti-tigit agents and in, in, in yeah. lung and other settings yeah and um you know I'm, I'm all for them being tested in the light of day in phase threes but i think that we need to have a yeah. uh uh, uh, an expansion of them that's proportionate to the strength of the base that they're on. <laughs> yes. And, and, you know, when there's 14 phase three trials of tidgets uh, base, based and le- on and lag three. One, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. I mean, it's just lemmings at some point. And, and that's, that is, I think going to be a humbling, sad place to be for the next couple of years, because I think that if this was anything, yes, maybe it's always possible that the the skyscraper one trial missed on PFS, but will win on OS. But mm-hmm. you know, I've never known a company to sit on positive results that they, <laughs> that, they, uh-huh. that they don't want to share with people as they give out a negative press release. So, and I think if this were recapitulating what we saw with you know Keynote O two four or something like that you wouldn't have equivocal or negative results at this point. You, you wouldn't have a stone cold negative uh, trial in small cell. Yeah, different setting. But I have a 
strong concern that that's going to be a humbling couple of years ahead. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, um, and I forget what's the sing- single agent activity of that drug. It's not good, is it? <laughs> it's, it's zero, is it? It's not. No, not, it's not active it's, as single it's, agent. It's not intended to. Yeah. It's, yes, yeah. and I think that th- those drugs in general, there, there's a reason why it has no activity. It doesn't work. But okay, we'll f- let them let them sort that out. But I do think I'll, one of the things you're talking see, about. See, they'll have their day in the sun. I mean, yeah. it'll be a fair test. But yeah. I just think it. You know, it's going to be a, a shame for patients if we end up doing five times as many trials as we needed to answer that question. Yeah. One of the reasons that is happening is because the incentives in the marketplace and, you know, every success P of 0.049 is $10 billion commercial success over the course of life cycle and cost of failure, although formidable, 50 million, 100 million they can lose. Um, it still incentivizes them to have broad portfolios and test things. And if they get lucky, they get lucky. Um, let me come to, uh, I mean, obviously one example I think is actually small cell lung cancer. We have had f- in, atezolizumab and dervalumab work, but Pembro and Nevo don't work. I mean, we can spend all the games we want about, you know, differences in trial. But I think one explanation is that they all work very, very modestly. Um, you know, one month, 1.5 month survival benefit. And some trials got a little lucky and some trials didn't get luck- lucky. That's exactly what I think is the case. Yeah. I, I don't, I mean, for better or for worse, we generally think of these agents as having a strong class effect yeah. and being largely fungible. And mm-hmm. yes, I, I would say the same thing about the the uh, you know the perioperative setting. Yeah. That you know, I don't think there's something uniquely astonishingly <laughs> excellent about nivolumab preoperatively. And you know, the Pembro data in Keynote uh, 091, the Pearls trial that's been mm-hmm. released as a you know an ESMO plenary was kind of underwhelming. Um, but I just think yeah, some trials, they just have the breaks and maybe it has to do with which patients are getting or not getting subsequent therapies. I think that's still understudied. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, uh, well, but well, yeah well. I totally agree with you. I don't feel that uh, it was a, an astonishing, how can this, how can we explain this in the world mm-hmm. when you know, they trend all in the same direction. Some break a little higher or lower than 0.05. Yeah. And that's why, you know, the companies are playing that game. And yeah, I mean, and Merck's market share versus BMS getting its ass kicked is largely because they got lucky slash trial, trialies. I mean, it's amazing that they're they're really going to capitalize on, even though they're second in class, they're going to crush crush nivolumab over, you know, over life cycle. But here's the point I wanted to make about, you know, the field and maybe even tie it to the exodus. I mean, Anecdotally, it feels like every day you open, you, you know, the ASCO, you know, the Twitter or the ASCO news, and it's, you know, another one of us is going to industry, you know, um, going to, far, you know, go this company, that company. It's, a, it's a, quite a bit in those of us who, who see patients. Um, your path is different in many ways because you spend a lot of time at Swedish, um, which is sort of private EMEA, um, you know, of <laughs> course, academic, but also pri- private EMEA. Um, you also were a pioneer in digital health, telehealth. Because to some degree, your personality, you're a little, you're rebellious. You know, you and I were rebellious, but you know, of course, we're both doctors. You know, so how rebellious? You know, we're not like rocker rebellious, but we're no. we're rebellious among no, doctors. I'm, I'm a first child pleaser still. So, you pleaser, you know. so yeah, yeah. But you still have a rebellious streak, and I think that's why you you were willing to take a chance with all these endeavors. Similarly, I think that's also why you're critical of trials because you're willing to take a chance and be critical, as you said. You know, tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm willing to put myself out there and maybe. Um, you know, you, you have that in you. I think I, I worry about our profession because, you know, you remember in the late 1990s, it was a different world. I mean, the industry involvement was very low for better or worse. You know, of course, there are things that they've done that are tremendous. We've never had so many targets, so many drugs, so much investment in this space. That's all good. Um, but the culture of the academy was very different. It would be very spirited debates, much more like how basic scientists argue about papers. People had very different points of view, schools of thought. Even when I trained in the early, uh, you know, late first decade of the 2000s and then early in the second decade, I think there were a lot of those people around. In the modern ecosystem, for a faculty member who finished fellowship and they joined City of Hope or Sloan Kettering or UCSF, there is really one canonical tract, and that track is, um, you know, I guess there's a few people running labs, and they have it even harder because they're they don't get the R01s. They're going to get you know thrown. You know, it's very hard for them. I don't, you know, I I have sympathy for them, but the default tract is, you know, pick a disease, focus on it, be a trialist, be a K, you know, go, do your trials, investigator initiated, but you also got to do some industry sponsored studies, um, and they look at their mentors, and their mentors are largely, not, you know. 
not critical of studies. They say, we got to play ball. You got to have good relationships with companies. Um, you may someday go work for the company. You got to have good relationship. Um, and I think it, it's gotten, uh, and, and of course we didn't say it, but I think, I think the conflicts are an issue that, you know, they're, it's the salaries that we get paid as doctors are much higher than the average person, but in major metropolitan areas, people do take a pay cut to work at, you know, a university setting. And I feel like, um, many people may feel justified, like, you know, it's not enough money to make ends meet. Um, uh, and it's okay to do ad boards and it's okay to do this and that, um, and, uh, you know, so, I mean, I don't, I don't blame any individual actors, but I do think that that money is given out for a reason. It builds allegiance, same way the Dalai Lama, same way the Hare Krishna gives you a flower in the airport before asking you for a donation. It's an allegiance building thing. And the net result is in 2022, it's even different, I feel like, than when I started, you know, on Twitter in 2015, really. I feel like it's different. It's much more of that cheerleader praise um, partnership mentality than it was. And I actually think that's one of the reasons why so many people are leaving because it doesn't feel special to be at University of Washington or UCSF. You, you know, the person who leaves our group and uh, decides to go work for pharma, um, he or she goes from rounding on patients and attending all the Zoom meter investigator meetings and rounding on patients and going home to just going to the same meetings and getting the morning and evening a little bit free and maybe getting another hundred thousand dollars in stock options. You know, I mean, so like the job has become so similar. Um, all right. So I guess it's not really a question, but just thoughts on this phenomenon well, of like, you know, is the profession different than it was when you, when obviously when you were a fellow to now, is it a different profession? Is that why there's so much burnout discontent? I, I am not used to being the optimist, but I, think I'm I'm more optimistic than you are here. And I <laughs> first of all I would say, yeah, the field's very different, but I think that all of medicine is more corporate. And I think that the biggest frustration is that so much of the whole enterprise is run by people who have never touched a patient. And I think that's a real problem that we feel that that we're just workers in the trenches, we're boots on the ground and 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 we're seen as fungible uh, objects. Uh, I think that's a that is part of the frustration, and you know, there's always just incremental. We're going to now charge you more for your parking, and you know, all of these kind of things are the death by a thousand cuts frustrations. But I, I think that there are things that are better. I think that when I entered the field. Uh, you know, the only models you had were the people who happened to work in your building and that uh, and you were told, well, this is the way we do it at the University of Washington or at Memorial Sloan Kettering or whatever. And and nowadays, through social media and a bigger world, uh, you know, I I interact with a much broader range of people. I hear how people do things in other countries. Um, and and we're exposed to just a, a much greater breadth of ideas. That includes your work and lots of other people. And uh, and there's more than just two or three oncology journals. I say there's you know a, a mind blowing number, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of platforms to share ideas. I'm doing mentoring for people outside of my institution. And I think that cross fertilization is good. It really helps uh, diminish the silo effects. You know, yes, there's certainly incentives to kind of play the game and, and, and uh, you know, be uh, affirming, but, but I see a, a younger generation of people, you know, you have, the Bishal Giawali is not just him, but like all the people who work along with him and follow him. I mean, he has a tribe of people who would take bullets for him. And and I think that's great. It's an international group. And, you know, people are thinking and talking about cancer ground shots. And and, and I, I think that it's maybe a subculture of the it's not the dominant culture, but it's not a negligible mm -hmm. uh, subset of people. And you have rising educators like you know Aaron Goodman who mm -hmm. are big influencers mm -hmm. who are not afraid to speak up and speak out against some of the you know the the trials and 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 companies and agents and and I think that uh, a validating model 
for for younger people of how to how to behave that isn't just uh you know following the same traditional path for uh nodding yes and and promoting trials that serve a corporate agenda yeah that's really really great of you to say jack and i'm glad you glad you're so one of us is the optimist and i think (laughs) um you know i'm gonna let you go in a minute but i guess i just want to say that and and among those people who um, people admire uh, should be Jack West. And I'll tell you a few few listeners a little things. People should go back and read, um, you know, an editorial you wrote, uh, No Solid Data, Only Hollow Promises uh, for Whole... uh, Hollow Evidence, yeah. Hollow Evidence, yeah. Uh, In Jam Oncology about um, the idea that we'll just sequence everybody and pair everyone with a drug, Um, which is, you know, every day there's steps progress on that, but it's still, I think, a promise. Um, uh, And to some degree, I've always felt it was a little bit hollow. Um, You had some great essay, I think, in Medscape uh, with with the cable channel, um, hmm. that you can have 800 cable channels, but you're really only going to watch four, you know, you know, that's the reality yeah. of, um, well, it just, and worse yet, it takes more time for you to realize there's still nothing on. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It takes more time. Um, <laughs> you know, and your essay on, in, in the JCO on Adora, and, uh, I think your advocacy pushing back on different issues on Twitter are really important. And I guess, I mean, I put you in a different sort of intellectual legacy. There were always, um, you know, in oncology, they've always been very strong people who um, uh, were happy to uh, go, you know, cheer on their colleagues when their colleagues, when they felt it was fair and also push back uh, when they felt it was fair too. I think Charles Mortel was one. I mean, Charles Mortel uh, felt very strongly about levamisole. Um, he felt very strongly about latril. He created the response rate to bunk latril. I think Bernie Fisher was one. I think Ian Tannock was one. Um, you know, he, he, he was a true lab guy and then a trialist, and then he became just such an outspoken critic. I think Tito Fojo was one. I think, um, you know, even outside of oncology, I think, uh, I think Peter Bach had a, had a big influence on drug price. And, uh, and I think for a while he had, you know, a few allies with Hagop, uh, Cantharjan, and, and of course, Vincent, who I, Raj Kumar, who I admire for that. And uh, I put you firmly in that tradition. It's the tradition of like the oncologist that I always, you know, when I saw that you had a byline, I always wanted to read it, you know, and I still do. I mean, you know, and, um, and I think listeners of this podcast should check out your papers, follow you on Twitter. Check out the podcast Beyond the Journal. Although it's been a long time since you dropped a new episode, I hope. Yeah, more yeah, yeah, that's we we gotta get back on. It. Gotta get <laughs> back on it. And um, yeah, thank you so much for doing this. And I think um, you know, I, I'm glad to have you out there thinking critically about lung cancer trials. Thanks, Jack. Well, thank you for having me, and it's really an honor to be on that list that you mentioned. And uh, well, great. Thank you for doing, staying in this, and being so committed to uh, both the the platform and the whole idea. We'll do it again sometime when there's some hot lung cancer issue that uh, is worth debating. Uh, excellent. I'll look forward to that. You take and care. You too. That was great. Thank you.